Hello, I hope everyone's doing well with the crisis. I'm sorry that we're meeting like this, but that's fine. It's still fun, it's still educational. Hopefully it serves as a nice way to distract ourselves from what's going on out there um, by talking about the supportive wives of Herman Melville and Frederick Douglass, who are Elizabeth Shaw, Anna Marie Douglas, and Helen Pitts Douglas. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the um, isolated stories and moments that they have where they directly contribute to their husband's success. So the beginning of the Melville's marriage. Melville, after he returns from his four-year voyage that inspired all his stories and his novels, he receives some acclaim for Typey, and he proposes marriage to Elizabeth Shaw in June of 1847. Melville's 28, she's 25, and Herman Melville actually dedicated Typey to her father. They only knew each other for three months, um, and that generally worked out. Um, they have their first of four children, Malcolm Melville in 1849. The couple buy a house in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They nicknamed the house Arrowhead. Um, this is where Herman Melville is working on Moby Dick, and also where he enjoys a cordial relationship with the author Nathaniel Hawthorne. In 1851, Moby Dick gets published, and it is received with confusion. They have three more children, Stanwix Melville, Elizabeth Melville, Francis Melville. Francis Melville is the only Melville daughter to have children. In May 1867, so this is by this point, um, Melville and Shaw have been married for 20 years. Melville is not only a failed novelist, but he's now also a failed poet. Letters between Shaw and her minister reflect that Shaw tried to escape Melville's physical and psychological abuse. Um, the minister suggested she faked her own kidnapping with her half-brother Samuel. So there is general concern in the community. Shaw doesn't actually go through with this kidnapping attempt, but it's something that's well documented through these letters. Shaw feared social stigma of facing the courts and the police. Her half-brother Samuel's letters say that her patience and fortitude will be turned into an argument against her belief in the insanity of her husband. So she feared of being gaslit or people not believing her or, you know, general concerns people have when they come forward about these abusive situations. There's also anecdotal evidence from their granddaughter Eleanor, whose daughter Frances, suggests that Melville threw Elizabeth down the stairs and often attempted to humiliate his wife and children. Um, so these stories often go untold because they're embarrassing, they're tarnishing Herman Melville's reputation, um, and it's just something that no one really wanted to talk about or provide evidence for. <laughs> so back then, drinking was co code for domestic violence. So when someone said my husband was drinking, it often meant that he was violent and cruel and had difficulties dealing with his own emotions. So family intervention was more common than legal intervention in most of these cases for reasons cited before. Um, there's embarrassment and there's fear. Elizabeth Shaw does choose to stay with Melville despite her fear and her family's concerns. She wants to be a good wife, she wants to be a good Christian, she wants to brave the storm because that's what she's told to do. <laughs> Melville would limit Shaw's contact with her friends and her family. He would require her silence on his health and his projects and what he was doing. He would monitor who was coming in into the house. He would cancel her plans if he didn't agree with them. And that's one of the hallmark criterions of abusive relationships is that they are controlling your social circle and your communications with others. He not only relied on the women in the house for clothing and food, but evidence also suggests that from Elizabeth's letters, she worked at his co as his copyist. So she would transcribe his um, handwritten script into a typed, polished manuscript. He actually told her to leave out the punctuation because he wanted that duty as the last revision to control what was going on with the punctuation. <laughs> so she also got him some book deals. She helped with his biography. And also something I noticed is that there are very few female characters um, who are not servants or ornaments and that exist in Melville's work. There's only two female characters in all of Moby Dick and they're not really characters who say anything interesting or do anything interesting, motivate the plot or cause any uh, real uh, problems or disturbances. <laughs> they just kind of exist. They're not really doing much. And there's also some evidence of erasure of Miss misogynistic annotations um, on Melville's um, written work. So it's just interesting how there's like this cover-up going on because 
Don wants to ruin his reputation. <laughs> Four months later, after Shaw's dilemma of whether or not she should leave her husband in 1867, Malcolm Meldville, he's 18 years old, unfortunately kills himself by a self-inflicted gun wound. Um, rumors suggest Malcolm's suicide was to spite his father for years of emotional neglect and abuse. <laughs> Keep in mind that in his first few years of life, Moby Dick was being written. So, and I think you can kind of get the vibe in Moby Dick that these long, exhaustive um, explorations and meditations on the many uses of hemp <laughs> that he might be avoiding <laughs> something about his family or his own self. The suicide is claimed to be one of the most indubitable pieces of evidence of Melville's general malevolence towards his loved ones. He, you know, was a difficult person to be around. Some sources say Melville was abusive because he was neglected as a child, which I think is a reach to explain things that are unfortunate, um, but does not excuse what's going on. Um, and this is the little bridge I have here, is that Frederick Douglass was raised in violence and the dehumanization of slavery, but there is no evidence or erasure of evidence that suggests that he ever abused his wife or children emotionally or psychologically or physically. So we can talk a little bit more about Frederick Douglass's and Anna Marie Douglass's marriage. So in 1838, they meet in Baltimore while Douglass was working as an enslaved caulker. Anna Marie, she's 25, she's five years older than him, worked as a housekeeper and a laundress. The laundry service gave her access to a sailor's uniform, which she famously gives to Douglass to aid in his escape. She gave him part of her savings, she sold a feather bit, and he escaped to Philadelphia and New York September 3rd, 1838. And less than two weeks later, she follows him and they marry on September 15th, 1838. She worked for the family that she left for about seven years. Uh, they raised five children in New Bedford, Rosetta Douglas, Lewis Henry Douglas, Frederick Douglas Jr., Charles Redmond Douglas, and Annie Douglas. And then there's some this citation at the bottom here um, that's by Rosetta Douglas. Uh, it's an account of her mother and her daily life and her sacrifices. Um, it suggests that um, while Douglas was out and giving these talks, um, Anna Marie Douglas was in charge of the house um, and taking care of the children. She was also still working. <laughs> so Douglas would send money back. And then um, Anna Marie Douglas kept working and she didn't accumulate any debts in his absence. Um, she didn't want to just talk about being a good Christian, she wanted to be a good Christian. They said grace at every meal and she took pride in her work. She saw it as an art. And also she encouraged her two sons to work for the North Star, the newspaper that Frederick Douglass ran. And by um, 10 and 11 her sons were learning about the the wonders of the printing press. <laughs> so unfortunately, Anna Marie Douglas dies at 67 from a stroke in 1882. After two years, he marries Helen Pitts. Douglas dies um, 11 years after this marriage, uh, 13 years after Anna's death in 1895, and he's buried next to Anna. So after two years, um, Douglas is depressed. He meets Helen Pitts, a white abolitionist. Uh, she's fighting for women's suffrage. Despite these progressive associations, her parents still did not approve of her marriage with Douglas. They didn't have any kids together. After Douglas's death, he left her Cedar Hill. Um, she wanted to make the site a memorial, but Douglas' kids wanted to liquidate the estate and divide the assets. So she buys the property from the kids, but cannot afford to finish paying off the mortgage before her death. The remainder of the estate was used for scholarships in Frederick Douglass's name, but today that's where the Frederick Douglass Museum is, and so it did end up being a memorial. Elizabeth Shaw was integral to Herman Melville's publishing career. She worked as his copyist, she was his wife, and gave him food and clothing and everything. She obviously did not deserve the trauma she endured. Um, Anna Marie Douglas was integral to Frederick Douglass's escape from slavery. Um, Helen Pitts Douglas generally loved her husband and fought to preserve his legacy. So some general discussion questions that I have is how can we separate the art from the author? Um, obviously uh, Herman Melville's work is absolutely brilliant. Well what's um, Elizabeth's voice? You know, like, And also how do we need to be, be monsters to make great art? Um, I think that's an interesting question just as uh, people who also want to be writers is that like is your art worth um, making everyone else around you unhappy? And is the art still worth it? You know, I think Moby Dick obviously like 
transcends dec- you know centuries and it's an important novel it's never going to be not an important novel but um there's also this subtext of uh, the people around him who are suffering and this is my we're excited page um i hope everyone stays safe and healthy throughout these difficult times but hopefully it served as a pleasant distraction um i hope everyone stays safe all right thank you and goodbye <laughs>